participants loading. All right. Hello, everyone, um, and good afternoon. Welcome to the National American Indian Court Judges Association webinar on um, continuation planning for tribal courts. I can see that the participants um, from the waiting room are still loading, so we will give them um, another couple minutes before beginning uh, this webinar. Hi, Richard. I see you. Uh, hi, Nikki. How are you? Doing well. Um, we are broadcasting, so we're going to begin very shortly. We're just waiting for the, um, the all the participants in the waiting room to load. Okay. All right, folks. It is 1 p.m. And uh, today is the first of NIJA's Rapid Response webinar series. So uh, last week, exactly a little over a week ago, we held a virtual talking circle called Administering Justice in Tribal Courts During the COVID-19 Pandemic. From that talking circle, NIJA, its board of directors, our staff, and our partners were able to pour through not only the discussion that was happening in the sidebar on the chat room, but also with regard to the responses that came about from the Survey Monkey and how you all have reached out to us individually regarding not only your court, your court operations, um, any court staff issues, um, but also, you know, some substantive issues that, you know, you're hoping to get a little bit more information on. Um, we decided from that particular discussion and line of um, communication that we opened there that we would begin to share information with you in real time. Again, this situation is unprecedented. Uh, a pandemic like this has not really shut down our courts um, and our communities in this manner. And so we are all learning together. And the idea behind this NIJA sponsored webinar is to ensure that, you know, we are able to share the information with you that we have in real time immediately. Do we have all the answers? We don't. And uh, Judge Bigler will speak to this. But um, the situation is ever evolving. We aren't quite sure what's going to happen hour to hour, much less tomorrow, much less what's going to happen next month. So as we um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a rapid response webinar. We are going to give you what we have when we have it. And so this first webinar is about continuation planning for your tribal courts, knowing that our states and our tribal courts have certain orders, either suspending courts or limiting court access. Um, this is hopefully some additional information so that we start thinking a little in the future, as opposed to just, you know, a few days to a few weeks ahead. And um, with that, we will formally begin the webinar. Um, my name is Nikki Borshart Campbell. I'm the Executive Director of the National American Indian Court Judge, Judges Association. We are located out of Boulder, Colorado. I am Paiute and Ute, originally from Cedar City, Utah. And with me today, I have the Honorable Greg Bigler, the Honorable Carrie Garrow, and Danielle Mayberry. Today, um, I, I've already given just the, the brief introduction, um, just some housekeeping matters. If you were with us last week, uh, the webinar is operating exactly how we operated, la operated last week. Um, you should have the opportunity to both raise your hand on your chat bar here and um, also click chat. And I encourage everybody to go ahead and click the chat 
um, bar right there. Introduce yourself, um, have conversations. Feel free to um, converse back and forth there. My staff and I will be monitoring that and trying to feed those questions into our Q&A. Um, there is also a formal Q&A process. So if you click on the Q&A, you'll also be able to ask your question there. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Judge Richard Blake, who is our president, to talk briefly about NIJA and to um, welcome you to the first of our rapid um, response webinars. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the, uh, the rapid uh, webinar uh, series that um, the NIJA staff has, uh, along with uh, Judge Bigler and Judge Garrow and Danielle, have uh, worked feverishly to make certain that, um, that we are on the forefront of the uh, pandemic uh, as, it, as it evolves. And um, the NIJA organization being the only tribal judges organization in the nation, leading the way in, um, in information and technology in Indian country. And the, um, the um, protocols and the procedures that are being utilized across the country by the, uh, by the various tribes. Um, I, um, I am uh, from Hoopa, California. I am, the, uh, uh, I am retired, uh, the retired judge of the Hoopa Valley Tribal Court and sit as the chief judge for the Redding Rancheria and Tallawadini Nation, uh, as well as I sit as a appellate justice for the uh, Cow Creek uh, Tribe in Southern Oregon. All three court systems are currently in, um, in suspended mode um, and operating only on a as-needed basis. And um, I think that these webinars are giving us the opportunity to dialogue with one another on what we're doing, how we're doing. And um, again, I want to um, give strong kudos to, um, to the NIJA staff for their diligence in making certain that the information that is being provided to you and to Judge Bigler, to Judge Garrow, and to Danielle for assisting in uh, presenting these webinars. Um, again, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for your participation today. And thanks again for, uh, for the opportunity to say hi. Thank you, Judge Blake. And the other thing that um, we wanted to mention that in addition to really taking the information that you're giving to us from the front lines, um, we have released some broad topics that we will be presenting on um, during this rapid response webinar series. So after this, we're looking at health and wellness, child welfare issues and other family law concerns, technology and e-filing, looking at your criminal dockets and due process issues, housing and evictions, domestic violence issues, including your emergency protection orders, and then also issues related to our tribal court clerks and administering um, work in light of these types of closures or uh, court suspensions. So just briefly, we are presenting to you some information that we have been able to collect related to the continuity of operations plannings for your courts. So in this particular webinar, we are going to give you some resources that include an example and some guidelines from the National Center for State Courts. Um, the National Center for State Courts released a guideline several years back called Continuity of Court Operations, or the Steps for Coop Planning. And I have included the link here but the idea behind continuity and operations planning is to ensure that in the case of an emergency or a pandemic, that the essential services are um, allowed to continue and that you can still administer justice in light of certain emergency situations. So that being said, the judges and I have all had this conversation realizing that a guide like this and a guide that was presented for the states um, these guys are really helpful in advance of emergencies and in advance of situations. And had we had a crystal ball and we could foresee this, we would try to be able to plan for a pandemic, a pandemic of this extent. Um, that being said, since we did not, we um, are hoping that we can present the tools 
um, that are um, presented in a variety of different guidelines and a variety of different guides and pandemic guides, especially from your states, um, so that you can look and pick and choose and see what is applicable and what is specifically helpful to you. So with the COOP guide from NCSC, um, I've included some reference from their website right here that lists the steps for the development of a COOP guide and um, related to your continuations, um, the continuations and the operations for your particular court. Um, obviously the first step of initiating the planning process, we've already jumped over that, but to prepare the elements of it, we all agreed that we are likely on the steps related to limiting business practices and limiting exposure to the public. So that is where we are and um, all of this is available for download. Uh, my staff and I are going to try to upload it here into the webinar, but if not, we will make sure that that is available to you all as um, a resource. Uh, we again use this and present it to you as a guideline and a resource because our tribal courts are all different. We all have a different scope of jurisdiction. Um, we all have different dockets, different specialty courts. And obviously we all operate very differently than state courts. So please use this as a guide and pick and choose. There are some work plans in there in this particular um, resource. So for example, if you are trying to work through identifying who your essential services are, who, what the essential services are and who um, are the essential employees in your court. For most of our tribal courts, that's pretty much everybody. Um, our, all of our judges, um, our court staff, our bailiffs, we understand that uh, most of the time we might only have one judge or you know, a couple court clerks and we don't have the, the type of um, employees that a state or a federal court system will have. So please browse through this particular guideline. Um, some of those worksheets did look very helpful. We realized they would not be applicable in all situations and to all tribal courts. So again, use that as a guide. The, the guide here is to just really help provide some resources to help you um, identify those issues and to ask the questions as you are trying to determine how you continue operations in light of this pandemic. And also the, um, you know, I'll also say these planning guides were developed with the caveat that, you know, it might be an emergency that might shut down, you know, your court. Um, or it might be some type of a, a pandemic, maybe like the flu. I don't think anybody foresaw something like a novel virus really shutting down operations um, across the state and across the tribes. And we know that a lot of your tribes have also limited who can access um, the tribe itself and who can um, enter tribal lands. So those are the types of considerations that um, we know that you're making. And again, no one has the answers exactly quite yet, but here's one resource. The other two resources, of course, are our judges and we're trying to provide you some comparative examples. So here we will allow uh, Judge Bigler from Muscogee Creek and then Judge Carrie Garrow and Danielle from St. Regis Mohawk to present how they are moving forward in planning um, court operations into the near future, through the few next few weeks, into the next few months. Um, that being said, judicial leadership is incredibly important, just generally. We know that our judges are leading from the bench, they are identifying best practices, and they are really trying to bring together our communities through multidisciplinary teams, through enacting new programs, um, innovative practices, through developing partnerships and friendships, to be honest, with our state counterparts as well, and determining, you know, how do we move forward in the best interests of um, our children and families, um, to ensure um, health and safety for our communities and how best to administer justice. And we see that and we recognize that and we also try to provide as much support as we can to develop um, you judges into the leaders of your communities. And that is 
important generally, but it is extremely important now um, as you are navigating through this particular situation. So um, that being said, I would love for Carrie and Greg to, of course, talk a little bit about judicial leadership and um, ha share any insights that they have um, in operating in their own courts and their own systems. Do you, want, do you want me to go first, Greg? <laughs> um, so, I can go. okay. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is really important, and which what I saw happen um, as this unfolded, I think something is critical. I, I'm very fortunate, have an excellent staff, and I saw, you know, and and we have a small staff, and our staff, you know, ranged between finding this situation incredibly stressful. Um, to the other end of the continuum of feeling like it wasn't really that big of a deal yet um, as it was just starting to unfold. And so I was just really impressed about how our staff supported each other, talked to each other, um, and and helped me as we were, you know, working to, to get things done. So I think that's critical is to have a good relationship with your, with your staff. Uh, I'm also fortunate I have a good relationship with our federal, state, and tribal court forum. And so we were in the process of planning a, our forum meeting in April. We were also doing a, our annual ICWA conference in April. And so we were in constant communication about what to do about that. And they were sharing, you know, what the New York state courts were doing. And, and that was helpful as well, having those relationships to to talk about things that were happening. Um, and and the court has a, a good relationship with um, with uh, our tribal council um, and also the tribal administration. You know, but we also walk that kind of difficult line of being separate and independent, sometimes being treated like a tribal program, and so we we navigate that. And this was a, a new experience for us, um, working with tribal admin on on this situation and. You know we're we're circling back and, and trying to improve that a, a, a little bit um, to keep the the court as a branch of government a little bit more in in the in the loop. But um, you know it's been a learning experience for all of us and very stressful. And and so I think that's something that we all have to be mindful of is understand that that everyone um, is experiencing this along with their families and just you know give them a, a little bit of space. Um, um, you know, as we're expecting a lot of them uh, to get their work done. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, this is Judge Bigler, and I appreciate and second what Carrie and uh, Nikki have said that uh, um, this is a uh, unique situation we're facing that none of us really, uh, are not sure that any of us really thought about. But uh, as we go forward, there's always new things that, go, that, we, that arise. Um, I don't think that we should be afraid of the fact that we're not sure or an expert as to this. I certainly am not an expert. Uh, I was asked to have some thoughts about it. And so, uh, I was willing to share what we've been doing at Muskogee Creek Nation. <clears throat> um, I may have been a little bit more um, early on some of these ideas, but certainly I wasn't as, uh, as in the lead as others. But uh, we try to learn and move forward and share um, with these different things. Now, uh, and we did, we have issued some things. Muskogee Creek Nation is a pretty fair size court, uh, not as large as some. Obviously, there's a few tribes that have much larger, but we're, we are quite a bit bigger than many. Uh, we have uh, 80,000 plus tribal members. We have, uh, I have four court clerks, uh, two bailiffs slash probation officers, and a staff attorney, and there are two of us judges there. So we stay pretty busy during normal time. These, of course, aren't normal times, and so we had to start planning and thinking how we're going to react. Uh, and certainly do not have all the answers. 
<clears throat> one of the things, though, I think we were concerned about is the dynamics of how we deal with this issue. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess, Nikki, I'll go ahead and get into a little bit of that. Um, and it's one of those things where every time I start thinking about it, I see new aspects to it or changing my thoughts as to how we should deal with this or how, how to interpret what, what we need to do. Uh, and I think that what, as judges, so many of us are familiar with the uh, American Bar Association's judicial ethics as to how we to handle things or approach certain matters or uh, appearance of, of uh, impartiality and so forth. And I think that we all uh, take those to heart as best we can in our tribal situation. But I also think that as tribal people, for those of us who are working with the tribal communities, that we as tribal people don't think in terms of ethics per se, but we think in terms of perhaps what we might call morality. And I'm not sure exactly where that differentiation is, but I know that our old people would talk about right and wrong. Now, maybe that's ethics to some extent, but it just seems to me that ethics is more of a due process type of situation, whereas our morality or those issues that we talk about in the tribe situation communities are spirituality-based as to what it is. Uh, I'm not going to say it's necessarily religious-based, but I think that there's an aspect that is tied into the whole community, communal nature, tribal nature of our existence. So when we start looking at things, um, what we don't think of necessarily being court matters might be, for instance, my discussion with one of my friends who is a chief with one of the four, uh, I believe it's four, still uh, active Cherokee ceremonial grounds, traditional ceremonial grounds, or their religious grounds. Now the Cherokee Nation has some 400,000 tribal members. And that's a lot. That's, I think it's the largest tribe in the country, if I remember correctly. Uh, and, but there's only four of the tribal stomp grounds that they had from their old religion, at least in the uh, Oklahoma territories. And David, the chief of uh, one of them, says that, to be honest, even though we may have 500 or 1,000 people at some of these dances on our main day, our main green corn day, if you look around, it's about 80 to 100 people who are keeping these things alive throughout the year, doing all the work, uh, gathering wood, looking for medicines, uh, taking care of the things they need to take care of throughout the year that go unseen for the rest of the year, except for that one day during the summer. And he's saying, you know, that if two or three of us get sick and pass away, those people who know the medicines that know the songs, that know the dance, that know what has to be done when and by whom aren't there and that which we are disappears and goes away. So it's an existential question in some instances that we're dealing with with this coronavirus. Now we don't know how bad it's going to get but I suspect it's going to get pretty bad over the next four or eight weeks. Uh, sounds like it may go longer than that. And even though with our tribal courts we may try to limit the access to people uh, at this point forward by only those participants coming in. At the most, and I, I, I'm sure that my situation is no different than 90% of you or 100% of you over the past three, four weeks. We had a criminal docket, which we got uh, continued most of the members, most of the people, but we had one or two who were still in custody, and so we had to bring them forward for their initial appearance or arraignment. One of the guys that we continued, the defendant, uh, his case was moved for 30 days off. But his 85-year-old grandmother was worried about him and didn't know it was continued. So she got in her car, drove into town, came to court, and we told her that court had been continued. And so she went on her way. But then we started thinking that this woman is probably a very highly one well, at risk category. Uh, she had to get out of her car, may have had to stop to get gas, came to court, had to talk to somebody at court, may have got started going home, decided she needed something in the store or to visit someone and she stops. And so the 
number of interactions with potential people who might give her the virus grows exponentially. And so even un unintended consequences, twin unintended consequences flow from that. So when we're doing these uh, actions, we have to think not only of our, our clerks that we have there, maybe one or two, not only of our police officers that are transporting and our defendants, but the public at large, our tribal communities. And while we may be talking, I may be uh, using as an illustration having just a handful of our people who, use, who are still fluent in our language and disappearing to disappear. Uh, my own uh, Gucci language is down to three or four fluent speakers. That's not that unusual for many other tribes. Uh, a few of you, your tribes are probably blessed to have many more than that. But it's not unusual. But even if we're not talking about language or traditional people, or whatever it happens to be, we're still endangering our community if we don't act properly and take these things into consideration. So that's what we were looking at uh, as we made these decisions. Now, that's just all background. I'm sure that each of you have probably thought about these problems. And of course, on the other side, uh, is the concern of, of people who have real needs for our court services, emergency protective orders, uh, and uh, uh, maybe guardianships, probably if this disease is spread, we're gonna have a great many more needs for emergency guardianships. Uh, we have people in custody and so forth. So, I think that kind of lays out the dynamics of where we are. I'm sure that each of you are probably familiar with those concerns. Uh, and then, of course, I know that uh, we are hearing in the news and the media concerns about the restaurant workers and the stores that are closing and uh, three or four million people who are suddenly seeking unemployment. And those are very real concerns as we try to fight this uh, disease. But it's also true in the court systems. Uh, again, uh, we have attorneys who are uh, sole practitioners, small towns, and they don't have a large source of income. They have one or two people working in offices, receptionists, secretaries, uh, and they also are trying to make a living and trying to provide services. And so each of these things that we do have an impact uh, Nonetheless, we as judges are put in these spots to make the hard decisions. And our responsibility is not just to the court, but I believe to our tribal community and to ensure their survival. Uh, so uh, there's some other things I can move forward with. I'm not sure if, Nikki, if you want maybe to move to some other areas before I continue on with some of these other thoughts. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Judge. And. Uh Carrie and Danielle will, there's Judge's Court, or Greg's Court. Um, we're gonna go ahead and turn this over to, to Carrie and Danielle to also share a little bit about how they assessed the situation um, and limited uh, court, um, court proceedings and, and basically how they are planning to move forward. So go ahead, Carrie and Danielle. All right. Thank you, um, Sego. It's uh, an honor to, to be here. Uh, some of you may have heard me speak last week at the, the uh, talking circle. And so um, some of this may be familiar to you. We thought uh, after talking with Nikki that um, we would uh, go through, give you some context of how we got where we are and, and what we're doing as we, we move forward. Although um, we're in this in the same boat that you are and many times it feels like a, a moving target that we think okay we're set and then we realize we have other things we need to do so um, and I'm glad to have Danielle with me she's our, our law clerk and has been um, incredibly uh, helpful through this process so Nikki you want to go to the next slide um, so I'll just talk briefly to give you some of the background of, of what happened um, so as we, you know, saw everything that was going on um, uh, with the COVID-19, 
Um, I was focusing on uh, with the forum, uh, whether or not we were going to move forward with our conference and um, our, our forum meeting in April. And it was the week of March 9th. It was later in the week. It was actually out of the office, but um, our traffic core is the, um, the court that has the most foot traffic. Um, so just a little background, we um, in New York, the state has concurrent uh, criminal jurisdiction. And so we are not exercising criminal jurisdiction. We're also not exercising jurisdiction over um, any other sort of uh, emergency type cases like, like child removal and, and child neglect. Um, and so uh, the traffic court judges opted to temporarily close the traffic court out of concern uh, of safety for people um, and um, for uh, approximately a about a month. Uh, also at that time, we, our court space is very small. We share a building um, with the tribal police. And so our focus was uh, on reducing our um, contact um, and the community's contact with us and our contact with the community to, to try to encourage people to stay home. Uh, uh, the chief of police talked to us because uh, county probation comes in and uses once a week an office that actually uh, the court uses uh, the rest of the days of the week. And um, Chief Rourke was concerned about all the probationees or probationers um, coming in. And, um, and, and it's usually, you know, a big waiting uh, group out in, in the front of the building. And so he uh, informed county probation that we were gonna um, uh, close that office to county probation um, for about a month. Um, and at that time, I also began um, with Danielle, um, and Danielle really prompted me to, to start the process of what we were going to do. And in my mind, at this point, this was early March, um, you know, I was thinking, okay, what's going to happen if one of our parties come in and later test positive or one of our court staff? And so we were focusing on closing the court, but more sort of as an, an, an emergency um, because we've come in contact with someone. Um, and so we started talking about that process at the same time, realizing we also needed to limit um, the contact with even our civil cases. And so um, I requested that the court clerks, they began uh, contacting all the parties for cases we had scheduled for the month of April. Well, actually March uh, and early April and ask them, it was whatever the parties wanted. Uh, we, could, we could do a, a video or a teleconference. We are fortunate we do have some video capability and, um, or they could continue it. And so um, we started to move forward with that. Um, also that time, uh, that week, as we closed up on that weekend, um, I had some staff who were on personal travel. Um, and as we were watching what was happening in the world, we're in very confined space and we started to have the concern about um, whether or not uh, these other staff members should be returning because they had been in places where possibly they could come in contact with people um, who, who might um, have uh, uh, COVID-19 and we didn't want to spread it uh, in the community. So that weekend I made the decision um, to ask, we ended up having um, three, three, four, actually four staff um, who had traveled to various places. And um, I'd made arrangements for them and just told them uh, that absolutely they could telecommute. The staff who was still able to come in were more than willing um, because we have such confined quarters to, to, pinch in, to pitch in and, and help uh, do what they couldn't do um, to, uh, because they were telecommuting. And so uh, and then, so I made that decision over the weekend and then um, subsequently the next, um, it was just like the next day, next couple of days, the tribe issued um, uh, a, a directive to the staff that if you did travel out of the community, then you had to um, uh, uh, be in quarantine for 14 days. Um, and also to discourage people if, um, if you, after the directive came out, if you still did it, then, then you'd have to use personal sick time. Um, and so uh, trying to, again, discourage people from traveling and, and, and bringing, um, spreading uh, uh, COVID-19 in our community. So um, that's where we were uh, at the end of um, actually Friday the 13th and going into that weekend. And then um, 
the next uh, Monday we came in, and if we can go to the next slide, Nikki. So um, we, there we go. So um, the next, uh, we were still, um, Danielle was working, she'd done a couple different versions now, because again, it was a, a moving target uh, of doing an admin order in, clay, in case, administrative order in case we needed to close, and she's gonna talk about that. And so then we started to hear, well, the, the tribe was actually thinking about um, closing down. And, and this is what, when New York State was also starting to uh, ask people to stay home. Um, and so um, by Monday night, they had declared an emergency um, and were encouraging, um, while well, telling people to stay home and um, essentially um, focusing on only essential staff could come into the building. So Danielle uh, finalized our administrative order. Uh, we closed the court to the public and you know, uh, decided to move all the hearings until later in April. Our staff is working uh, remotely. Uh, originally, we started out thinking you know, it wasn't a, a big deal, or at least I did, um, uh, if we had a couple people in the office at the same time. But as uh, things began to get worse in New York State, um, I, I told the staff, because uh, we all left the building Wednesday afternoon, um, which was March 18th. Um, by the end of the week, I told the staff that only one person in the office at the time. So we have um, clerks going in every day, taking turns um, just to check the mail and work on their cases and, and do anything uh, that we need to do. We've already issued um, some orders from some other cases that we're working on. Um, and so we are still uh, going along. Um, and so Nikki, next slide, please. So, um, and we'll talk about, um, we did have, uh, we do have a couple different administrative orders and we'll talk about um, those, uh, uh, the different kinds we are, but um, I'll let Danielle talk about exactly why we did the administrative order and um, uh, uh, what we included in it. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, um, I'm Danielle Mayberry. I'm the law clerk at the tribal court as Judge Garo said. Um, so we actually did two administrative orders. We did one um, that talks about cease and desist and another one explaining the court process. And when this was coming down, um, thoughts I had was recognizing that we primarily deal with um, probate and land dispute cases. Um, we see, so there's a lot of land transactions that are pending in our cases or there are individuals um, just wanting to sell land um, that are involved in land disputes. So looking um, at New York State and other jurisdictions, what they're doing, um, I noticed is issued um, administrative or orders on um, ceasing and desisting um, evictions. So stopping those sort of cases happening for about 30 days. So one thought that I had was let's do a cease and desist for um, our land cases, cases that deal with land disputes and probate cases. So that way land transactions don't occur um, during um, that are involved in these cases can have to be can be assured that nothing is going to happen to the land because that is a very it's a very contentious high um stressful um topic here at saint regis is land and then another administrative order we did was explaining and outlining how to use the court and at this time while we're somewhat closed and the tribe is in the tribe is um limiting access to tribal buildings and also explaining um, how, how to file, uh, make filings. And in this administrative order, it gives email addresses to our clerks uh, to access our court by sending in your filings to the court clerks. Or also it gives contact information for our court administrator. Because one thing that is unique, I think, for tribal courts is that we're, very, we're usually small. There's cases that, you know, Navajo Nation, Muskogee Creek, um, Judge Bigler's court is very much, is lar larger than ours. Um, at the community, that way everyone knows how to use our court at this time, because it's very, it's unprecedented times. And one reason, um, our administrative order is very broad and it doesn't give um, a closing date as to when we'll, I mean, an reopening date is because 
we wanted to make sure that people can use our court when we're closed and have all their questions answered by looking at this administrative order. And one thing that um, I wanted to make it a, one reason I wanted to make it as broad as possible was because I recently went to a training that dealt with um, court security. And one of the judges there, he was a state, was he was a Wisconsin state judge. He talked a lot about a case that he dealt with um, that was, it was a murder case and he all of a sudden, it's a small jurisdiction for what I understood. And he wanted to make sure everyone understood how court security was going to change, how the press, like they were limiting the amount of um, journalists that can access the court um, for this case. And he talked about using administrative orders as tools. So that way all the key players know how to access the court during unprecedented times. So that is why our um, administrative order goes more into just suspending rules. Um, I noticed in my research that a lot of um, judges, including tribal judges, they use their administrative orders as keys to suspend like filing requirements on um, like dates, move dates and give dates as to when initial appearances, um, hearings and trials will take place. Um, because, <clears throat> One thing I think is useful is kind of just applying some of that logic is just that way um, the, tri the, the tribe in general knows how to use our court and the, the people who are currently involved in cases. Because I think it's important that we continue to process these cases because people need to be assured that we are still working on their cases because most of these things, I mean, they're very stressful to community members in our land disputes. People are always calling about them. So this way they know how to contact us. Um, and then another important key is recognizing um, that you have to make that make those orders um, available to other people. So one, we made sure we sent it to our bar list immediately. We sent it to the the entities that we deal with on a regular basis. So for at St. Regis, we sent it to the tribal clerk's office that is responsible for issuing deeds here at the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. And we sent it to the child support enforcement unit to make sure that they knew that they could file, that people can still use our court. Like they could file modifications for child support. Um, and then our judicial oversight commission that regulates and oversees the judges there. Um, and then I also talked to um, our chief judge of the court of appeals, Pat Lindsay, and she issued an administrative order response to make sure that there was a, an administrative order issued from them affirming our process. So that way there was no challenge possible that could, well, to at least make, uh, make it uniform in our, um, to all court users. Um, I guess, is there anything else you wanna add, Carrie, Judge Garl? No, I was just going to uh, give the example, one of the um, rules we suspended, we, so we have this rule, uh, the docket rule, where our clerks have to enter uh, uh, judgments in the docket book at a, at a certain time. And uh, we felt that was unworkable because the clerks, you know, were only going to be in the office a limited amount of time. Um, and so we suspended uh, that rule. And um, again, to reduce a, some of the work on the, the, um, the clerks and also just to make sure that we could still function um, as a court, even though we were working remotely. So, you know, it's things like that, that Danielle did a really good job of, of identifying what rules um, perhaps that we needed uh, to, to suspend temporarily while we were working um, remotely. Uh, Nikki, next slide. So yes, yeah, so Danielle covered all of these um, that we did the admin order explaining how we were closed to the public, uh, the season desist for the land transfers, and then Judge Lindsay, I think I saw her in the chat, so hello to her, um, her um, administrator, administrative order from the appellate court, and I believe that, that Nikki has posted all of these on the NIJA uh, page, so they're available for you. Cool. Another thought, um, in our administrative order, we also included language about the healing to wellness court. Yes. So, it, um, so if you have any healing to wellness courts, it's important to note how um, the individuals will be monitored. And Judge Garo and our um, and our court, our healing to wellness court coordinator, decided that it was important enough to will note that they're going to be monitored remotely. So that way, everyone knew how the individuals 
or on how our staff will continue to work with them. Yes, yeah, so we're um, monitoring our, um, we only have two right now, but they're being monitored remotely. We're not doing drug testing. Um, the way we look at it is we're just, and I don't wanna say just, this is incredibly stressful time, I think for anybody, but I think especially for people who are uh, dealing with addiction issues. So just monitoring them um, um, and providing support uh, through this time. So. So yeah, I think it's important uh, to include all, all aspects of, of your court. Uh, next slide, Nikki. Oh, back. There we go. <laughs> More. There you go. <laughs> okay. So we're not hearing any cases. We're, we're, we're working on, we have some decisions to do, but we, we don't have any hearings until the 20th. And, and we simply chose that, that date. Um, I think that was the, the date uh, the tribe was, was looking at as sort of when they'll make their, their next decision about uh, what's going to happen. But um, so we chose that date. Um, we have one staff person in the office at a time. Um, everyone's working from home. I already talked about healing to wellness. Um, and so we're getting ready to, um, you know, how we're going to handle cases electronically. The traffic court did decide to extend their, their in the process of extending their closure date, um, but, it, but they're still processing pleas and judgments that come in through the mail um, and changed because typically the clerks do a lot of mailings um, doing judgments, but they changed. Now they're doing um, a public notice and it's, it's posted on our, our uh, page again to um, make it um, a little bit easier on the the staff. Um, did you, uh, next slide. So well, we probably could have talked all day about our problems. I think these were the um, the the two that we we've, we've struggled with right now. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have good technology in the fact that we we have video conferencing capability and they're working on expanding that and we do have our um, uh, conference calling capabilities. Um, but we don't have remote access to our court database, which is a huge challenge because as Danielle and I are working from our different homes on cases, you know, I'll ask Danielle, do you have this? And because I actually, as a judge, I don't access the court database anyways. And usually it's Danielle or one of the court clerks who does it for me. And, and of course she'll, you know, she can't access it from her home. And so we both struggled with that um, and had to rely on court clerks who, when they do go in the office to see if they can find what we're looking for. So we're looking at um, a modifying and um, uh, uh, seeing if we can get um, access, um, remote access to our court database. Right now we don't have any Wi-Fi in our building and that could be um, and will be a problem going down the road as we're thinking about doing um, more video conferencing and we're also talking about doing, um, uh, depending on how things go, um, uh, doing video conferencing for the traffic court um, from another room. Um, uh, so, and just so you know, I think a majority of our judges are high risk um, individuals for COVID-19. And so we're just, you know, we're, and a lot of our community is high risk. So we're just looking at ways to, to minimize, minimize um, but still uh, going forward. So we're looking at um, in the small room where probation used to occur, if we can have a, a tablet in there um, and video it into the courtroom um, once we open the uh, court back up. Um, the other challenge was the judicial code itself does, um, does not allow uh, the chief judge or any judge actually uh, to declare an emergency, um, you know, and so, so that's something that we're looking at changing. Danielle, did you want to talk any more about our problems that we've struggled with? Um, I think you've covered it with <laughs> the technology. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, Nikki. So what are we doing now? Um, so I already talked about the traffic court. Um, we're uh, thinking about um, when we go back to work, it, it will be partial um, and just having our judges use video conferencing um, and then potentially not allowing the public. Um, but we should know there will always be a record. And so um, the thought right now is, is that um, uh, 
we would have a, the only person in the courtroom would be the court clerk who runs the record um, or the recording. Um, the person either can tele teleconference in or video conference in, um, and then the judge can also um, do the same. So the nobody's coming into contact with anybody. Um, we are focusing on. No, go ahead, Danielle. Oh, one thought. Um, so one thing that I think is important that if you're going to choose to use things like technology is to make sure that you develop a document explaining how to use that technology. Because when we were thinking about this, one thing that comes to mind is it's we have a lot of elders use our court and many of them won't know how to use this or so we're in the process of process of developing a one two page document that just gives kind of like highlights about how to comp you know use our conference call number and if you choose to use things like our mondo pad so just trying to continue to make it as user friendly as possible yes yes and our court clerks are super good at um because we've we've used actually teleconferencing a lot and they're really good at, at walking people through it and but yes it's and all of this we will not only send to parties but post on our facebook page and or not our facebook page on our website and then have our the tribes communication also uh post on the the tribes facebook page uh, we're also developing rules for video conferencing that parties can't record things um, they cert they're certainly welcome, you know, to have other people there listening, but only the parties can talk. Obviously, if it's an open case, uh, open to the public, not a, a child support case. Um, uh, we also talked about, and I think Danielle pointed this out from a uh, the court security training that um, she had uh, been to, is that we're um, looking at designating a future court space um, in case even, you know, with as as good as we're trying to be, um, someone uh, becomes sick who's been in the courtroom. So we can keep going and just have a, a different space where we can uh, hold our hearings. Next slide, Nikki. So, um, and I'm going to let Danielle talk about this. What um, I raised this um, with my court administrator um and and danielle is that we don't the tribe doesn't have a process in place um if we have individuals who are under quarantine if they violate the quarantine you know are they going to go to the county court what's going to happen um are they going to come to tribal court um and sort of uh we're not going to be prepared um and so um uh, danielle you know just took this and ran with it and pretty much 24 hours had a draft pub, public health and safety ordinance, which we gave to general counsel. It's not enacted yet. We're, we're meeting on it tomorrow, but Danielle, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah. So like Judge Garo said, there, there's a concern about people by like, even it's not just quarantine, but like, let's say someone, cause right now at St. Regis there, you can't travel above uh, out 50 miles, I believe it is. And then there's also talk about um, a shelter in place. So, and, they're, and the tribal council is doing this all um, pursuant to their authority um, for emer you know, emergency situation. Also, they declared a state of emergency. So, one th what we did was, is we drafted um, a, let's see, what is it? A public health and safety ordinance. And it talks about situations where it violates um, a TCR or rules, regulations, or law. Um, that are, that's designed, you know, that it has been passed for this state of emergency or quarantine. Um, we made it as broad as possible so it can be used in these type of situations, not just COVID-19. Um, so what I did was, is I looked to, there's over half um, of state jurisdictions have laws talking about quarantine, isolation, and there's a few tribes um, that have uh, quarantine and isolation laws that lay out a process for if someone doesn't, um, like if they don't quarantine themselves and they're out in the public. Um, and most of these laws, there's a either, there's an administrative and court aspect to it. Usually there's, in the states, there's a, um, a health board that after a governor or some states allows this board to declare a state of emergency, they can, uh, the board can quarant uh, have someone quarantined, like if someone po tests positive for a highly infectious disease or something, 
Um, so what we did, what, what I did was, is I looked at um, uh, tribes that do uh, the, what is it, Pasqua Yaki has a, um, has some law and so on this topic. And then, and then we also see in a public health code is what they have. And then, I, and then you see tribes like Bay Mills that have, that put a sentence in their um, criminal law talking about if someone violates a state of emergency TCR um, enacted by their tribe, it's a, so like if they went out, um, they tested positive for COVID-19 and they went out in the public um, that they can be charged up to a couple thousand dollars. I can't remember exactly what the civil penalty is. And it's a um, class B misdemeanor. Now here at St. Regis, we don't um, exercise criminal jurisdiction. So we're unique even in the tribal aspect of it. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there's a process. So that way, if the community, if someone wants to bring a case um, at St. Regis, we have something written and because right now we don't. So I look to, um, I highly recommend just looking at these other jurisdictions laws, and then also looking at processes that are established at your um, tribal jurisdiction. So here at St. Regis, we have a lot of administrative tribal, like um, working uh, administration and court uh, codes, like dealing with environmental laws. So like there's cases where the environmental director identifies that someone, um, lit, uh, someone left solid waste or something that, uh, out within the community and then they write them a write them some sort of citation and then they can enforce that and if they have trouble they come to the court so i did a combination of that i looked at state jurisdictions and so we identified someone in our in the tribe that is a department head that can regulate if someone um test pot like let's say they test positive for COVID 19 they know that they saw them at a local restaurant or or they're notified by someone in the community they do an investigation and these are short timelines um that we put in the ordinance and they do an investigation they um issue an order and then if they have problems getting that person to follow their order they can file a case at the tribal court and because of these normally our laws allow for them to appeal to the appellate court um we didn't do that and the appeal is limited to the tribal court and also a uh, thing to keep in mind is emergency situations so sometimes there might be instances where some um where whoever you choose a director head or something thinks that this person is out and about and will not um that this is a dire need so instead of the 10-day investigation or five-day investigation period you have may, um just they can have emergency authority to write an order that day so um so this was an ordinance that we have been, we um, provided to the general counsel's office here at St. Regis and the tribal council is currently considering it. So if you don't have a code that addresses, especially with how highly contagious um, COVID-19 is, it's something to consider. And one of the things we just, I had Danielle throw in, even though we, we had already submitted it to general, uh, tribal council um, and we're meeting on it tomorrow, is uh, we, uh, our chief of police, we saw a document from the county that just some of the process they use and they monitor um, people with anklets. And I said, hey, we have anklets from our Healing to Wellness Corps. And so we put that in there. And so if you have someone who has been violating the quarantine, that's a way to monitor them is to put an anklet on them and, and use GPS monitoring. So um, if that gets enacted, um, we will be happy to, to share that with you. Um, just a, a few quick other comments, because um, I'm sure there are questions and I know Nikki has some other things she wants to share. I forgot one bullet point on there is that um, when this is over, Danielle and I are going on vacation because <laughs> we need a vacation from the pandemic. Um, uh, so, you know, we're constantly talking about new court rules and pr procedures for pandemics in general. Uh, it was, I had to laugh today. I was listening to a podcast um, by the National Association of Court Management uh, today and they were, it was a, a bunch of court administrators and one of them, I think, I can't remember the question, it was something like, you know, what do you wish you had done and, and some, and one of the administrators said, we wish we would have finished the COOP guidelines that Nikki talked about. So, um, so we are not the only courts that are quite prepared. Well, there's also examples of court rules and procedures, I believe, in the pandemic handbook. So yeah. if you're looking for more on um, examples, that's a good place to start too. 
Yes. And we also, um, we had just um, a few months ago, well, it's been more than a few months, we've been getting our court security team up off the ground, um, sent a few people to training. And so now we're going to have a subcommittee that, that focuses on uh, this uh, to make sure we're prepared, um, you know, as we even more prepared uh, next time around. So, so those are the things that we're working on right now. Um, I think we've, maybe there's one more slide. So um, I think we've kind of already talked about this when we we're talking about leadership, but, um, and I know Nikki does this with her staff that uh, we try to check in. Uh, I text um, uh, some of the staff, um, the, the two staff that I directly supervise, which is Danielle and, and my court administrator, I talk with them several times a day. The rest of the staff, we've been trying to do uh, video meetings. Um, not everyone can video in just because of the way the internet is, here and we're right next to Canada and so sometimes it it doesn't the Wi-Fi isn't all that great um, but I think that's important um, and so all the different supervisors check in with the staff at various times just to see how they're doing um, and just being honest and upfront and that you know what I don't I have no idea what's going to happen you know we're in the situation where um, you know our casino has shut down and um, you know the the tribe is um uh you know dealing with that and and loss of revenue and so you know it, it's a it's a tough scary time and just acknowledging that and being honest and up, up front and um and letting you know the staff know that you know they can speak up and 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 we've we've emphasized with the staff that we have going in the office right now we've told them over and over if you are not comfortable being there um let us know and two um, if you're not feeling well, even if you're not going in, if you're not feeling well, let us know. So um, it's just important to, to, you know, keep, keep an eye on your staff and, and um, see how they're doing in their families. And I think that might be the last slide. Yep. It is. Thank you, Judge Garrow and um, Danielle. One of the, the reasons um, I had asked um, Judge Garrow and Danielle on is because, you know, in reading the court orders, um, I really liked how thoughtful uh, the, the administrative orders were, especially as it pertained to the healing, well, healing and wellness courts. And uh, we had talked about, you know, Danielle's kind of thorough research. We had also been talking and asking about questions related to quarantine and, you know, other tribal legislation and codes out there that might be addressing some of these issues and so you know thank you so much Danielle we really appreciate you know the work that you're doing and then also with, uh, being able to share that with uh, all of our participants here because I think that while you know obviously we don't have every single answer quite yet um, I think it, it really helps um, kind of lay out at least how you navigated your specific situation um, and just as an, an overview, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to questions really quickly, but um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit and to address those, those points and to, again, emphasize those for those, um, all of our uh, folks who are listening. But basically, you know, some of the, the main points that Carrie and Greg have talked about were number one, that they assessed the situation in their communities, which you know included looking at their cases, their dockets, whether there are any emergency declarations, any um, shelter at home orders. Um, they identified rules that, um, that needed modification in their courts. They looked at you know, limiting personal contact for in-person uh, cases and hearings. Um, you know, Greg, there's a question related to um, jury trials and uh, the criminal portions um, that I'll ask you very shortly. But, you know, really assessing your court. What are you hearing? Um, you know, what does your docket look like? Um, how far can you um, delay and continue cases, especially if you might have a jury trial coming up? We have issues related to due process and speedy trials. And then drafting those administrative or orders and really, you know, doing the research um, within, you know, your own tribe, your own court uh, codes, your own rules, and then ensuring that you're making it available and that you're communicating um, your plans and actions with other tribal departments, um, with other other governments, uh, governmental actors, 
And then, of course, you know, with your partners, we do have some tribes and tribal courts that have joint jurisdictional courts. We do have a lot of PL280 courts as well, um, folks that have um, good working relationships with their state and county um, cohorts. And then we're looking at issues related to handling cases electronically. We're um, trying to pull together a webinar on that specifically. We have some judges who are doing um, and have been hearing cases electronically um, from their living rooms. So um, we wanna look closer at the tech. Um, the Administration for Children and Families actually released a list of software and apps that can be particularly helpful in situations where there needs to be either face-to-face -face monitoring or continued hearing uh, related to technology. And we do have that up on our website along with the um, letter from Commissioner Milner and um, ACF uh, related to um, encouraging folks to continue the administration of justice for children and families. And then um, lastly, you know, and I think that's why we're all here is how do we handle um, these questions. How do we continue the administration of justice into the future, especially since so much is unknown? And Carrie and Danielle, you definitely provided some really good foundations and some information related to, you know, how we can all move forward, um, looking at our codes, drafting our codes. But um, we do know that a lot of our populations, especially our most vulnerable populations, depend on our courts to protect them and to keep them healthy, and especially our children. And with that, you know, there, there needs to be a, a particular plan in place. Um, a lot of the, the orders that we've seen that have closed our courts have been, you know, for a month or maybe through April and that's, you know, tribal state, some of the federal as well. But now we need to look forward a little bit more knowing that we definitely have people that depend on our courts to keep them safe. Um, you know, there's also a question with regard to children and visitation, being able to, you know, monitor certain visitation. Um, where there, you know, might be a reunification, you know, are, is it reasonable to keep children and parents from seeing each other for three months? Is that going to harm the child in the end because we are not allowing them to have access to, you know, the parents when we're really trying to encourage reunification? And um, last week, we'd also identified some other um, issues related to, you um, supervised visitation, um, custody issues as well. So those kinds of questions are ongoing. And there are some guides um, in the uh, NCSC cooperative, <laughs> uh, the continuations plan, the COOP plans, um, those worksheets, take a look at them. Um, like I said, you know, take a look at those worksheets, see if they're helpful to you at all. Um, the one, again, that I would point out would be limiting personal contact. I had chatted with a friend who was a staff attorney at a court um, where they had limited, and she's basically finishing some of their continuation planning as well, but they have limited um, access to the courts except for when something needs to be heard in person. And she said that those, uh, those cases are happening. And um, so in that instance, how are you screening individuals who are accessing the court? Um, are you telling individuals to call ahead if they're sick, um, to you know, allow them to have continuances? Um, and if you are screening individuals and allowing them to access your court, Who's screening? Are you giving them the appropriate um, medical gear to ensure that the staff or the bailiff um, is protected um, in all circumstances? You know, are, there's constant new evolving guidelines by the CDC uh, on how to you know protect ourselves out in public. And um, especially, you know, for those, those medical providers, we definitely know that the PPE just isn't there for not only those in large communities and 
where we have you know hospitals here in the metro area but we especially know that the pp isn't there for our tribal health and our tribal communities and our tribal hospitals so you know you weigh all of those issues and if you are allowing accessibility into your courtroom you know what type and what type of gear what type of protective gear do you have available and is it even accessible so those are the the types of questions you need to consider and ask yourself as you're moving forward with these um these continuation plans so um i'm going to go ahead and ask a couple questions greg i'm going to pose the first one to you i know that we had chatted about this several times over the past month in the um through board um, meetings and a little bit last week but scott moore um, from southern mute has a question about how judges are handling the issues of speedy trial. So um, he says on the Southern Ute Reservation, we have cases set for jury trial in April and that we are at the end of speedy trial. We obviously cannot impanel a jury right now, but we wonder how other judges are handling this issue. Do you have any insight? And then of course, anybody um, online, if you want to try to answer that in the chat, please feel free. I'm not sure if we have an answer to it. We had a jury docket set this uh, March. We had uh, two weeks of uh, criminal matters, and then we had a week or two of uh, uh, juvenile matters that were set. The uh, criminal matters were, as we as we saw this coronavirus coming forward, we were extremely concerned uh, about, our biggest concern actually was about the uh, jurors coming in uh as, as i said we're a fairly good a fair sized tribe and so we would have had about 80 to 100 uh, jurors coming into our uh court building and we have an auditor auditorium that we share there with the, with the legislative branch and as this was beginning to ramp up obviously we were concerned about any elderly or sick anything else all being put together uh before this was even before the corona had really accelerated but that's what we we're starting to worry about so we started talking to the opposing to the attorneys and saying, "Is this going? Is this trial going to go? Are you going to settle it? Are you going to continue it? Let us know." And so we set a, uh, I set a uh, sounding docket. I think about a week ahead of time, saying, "Are you ready for trial? Are your witnesses going to be here? If you're not, we're either going to dismiss this matter." If you're not ready for speedy trial on the defense, on the, on the uh, prosecution side, or we're going to push it off to the fall. Uh, and uh, those trials went away. Uh, and the same occurred with the juvenile matters. Now, uh, when we read the people that are right in the criminal matters, of course, you say uh, one of those, two of the things that we state is that you have, of course, the right to subpoena witnesses, the right to a speedy and public trial. Uh, for us, fortunately, those are all now onto the fall term for anyone that comes forward on a jury term. Uh, we set that twice a year. Uh, our uh, buildings at the Muskogee Nation, the executive branch chief has issued an order last week closing public access to all the buildings. Uh, and non-essential workers are basically uh, at home. So for the court, at least, if they have business or emergency, something like that, then there is a number on the door of the building that they can call and we will let them in. Uh, so that, that's how we're taking care of that at this point. Now, uh, we had, as I think I mentioned at the start, uh, two criminal matters on our docket for uh, Monday of this week. Everything else was pushed off because there were either reviews or uh, they were uh, dispositions, so there, there wasn't anything that was uh, uh, a speed trial issue. But we did bring those two in, and so we had to take care of them. There are timelines that we have to worry about. For instance, if they have a uh, 20 days for a, uh, if they're in custody as far as having revocation here and so forth. So we have to look at that. Now, the one thing that we probably don't, won't come up because we have issued an order and Nikki, let's see if we can share this or not. Okay, uh, we'll have to, uh, let me share my screen. 
Nikki, let's see if you got that now. Am I able to do it? Unshare uh, Terry's screen. And I'll try and put mine up. You got that, Greg? Let's see. Not share a screen while participants are sharing. <coughs> Let's see. Here. Well, I was going to share a screen shot, but it won't let me do it, I guess, for some reason. Yeah, let's see if that'll work now. Okay. Um, Greg, if we can't do the share right now. We'll all right, anyway, um, we issued on the 17th of March a, our uh, district court order, emergency order temporarily suspending non-emergency non matters for 30 days. And so we continued uh, anything that wasn't a civil emergency protective order, criminal legal appearance, arraignments, bond hearings, other necessary for due process, uh, emergency custody, emergency protective orders, emergency guardianship matters, other emergency hearings. Those were the matters that continue to be heard. So if it was your, I hate to say it, but your normal average kind of uh, court matters, those were pushed off. But we uh, paid attention to the fact that we would continue on with uh, the uh, whatever was due process required. Now, one of the things is that you say, uh, so we were only going to allow the people who are in on the particular case to be present in the courtroom. So, uh, but in a criminal matter, at least, they have a right to speedy and public trial. Now, I don't really think that any reporters would show up, but we've had over the past couple of years a few high profile, whether it's from interest of the, of the tribal newspaper or even from the local or national newspapers, <laughs> um, cases that would uh, that would be of interest and the media might have shown up. And those, because the constitutional requirements of speeding public, we might have had to require or allow them to, to appear. Uh, and so maybe we would have left the reporters in. I don't know. So that's one of the things that uh, we were concerned with. Uh, when you have those things which are unintended consequences issuing these orders. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a constitutional requirement that you have a trial within 120 days and the defendant requires it or pushes for it, I'm not sure how else you would get around that unless your court is otherwise closed then it might be suspending the tolling, the time period. That's the only thing I would think about, perhaps. I don't know about that. Well, I guess at some point we will find if that happens. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we do have a question generally about, um, for both of you, how are you doing with tribal members who have contracted COVID-19? And um, are there any tribal members in either of your communities? We had one. Um, and of course, due to, to HIPAA regulations, um, that name was not released. And uh, we had an interesting scenario. The person didn't want to um, obviously have his, his or her name released, but actually made a statement to the community that, that they had followed all the guidelines and was doing well. I don't think the person had to um, be in the hospital, uh, that person's statement talked about being, being isolating at home and that they were, uh, okay. And on their way to recovery. So, um, yes, so we've had one so far. Um, I did, I, I do know, I think we're in one of those situations. So people on the reservation can go to a couple different hospitals. So they might go to one County or they might go to the County that um, that's just next to the reservation. Um, so, and, and it seems like at least one of our counties has a, uh, they're waiting, has, has a, a backlog of, of uh, waiting for results. So, so it'll be uh, interesting to see and, and uh, hopefully we'll hope for the best, but um, that there won't be any more. But, um, but I know in the county next to the reservation, that's the county that I live in, 
um, the numbers have been going up. Do you anticipate having to um, write things like quarantine orders? It, yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, we went to council because that was my concern because I, I mean, I think knowing my community, I think, you know, most of them will do the best that they can do, um, you know, but, uh, you know, there, there are a few out there who might think it's no big deal um, and, and, you know, not want to uh, follow the quarantine um, while they're waiting for their test results or, or when they've been found out to be positive. So, you know, I, um, you know, I, I'm hoping we never have to use it, but I'd rather have it on the books and never use it than they come to the court and we go, huh, yeah, we don't have a law on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. I need to not have it. <laughs> um, so how might you be able to keep a record of hearings done through Zoom, um, teleconference, or any other app? Um, do you or Danielle or Greg have any um, insight on this? Well, I think the Pro has a uh, record feature, so that's probably something you do, or you could use a, a, a digital record or something uh, for purposes, uh, especially for those of us that are uh, in, in the criminal matters where it's supposed to be a court of record. I think that's what we'd, we'd want to do, and that's what we'll explore. One of the things we haven't talked about thus far, I know we're running a little, out of time a little bit, is that on the criminal matters is that we want to make sure that we take care of any people who are arrested and how we handle that. Um, we have uh, consulted and conferred, the judges, as myself and the Judge Prescott, have talked with the uh, Light Horse, which is our tribal police, our Indian Child, uh, Child Welfare Department, and our domestic violence people as to how we're gonna handle emergencies or other matters that come up during this point. Uh, and for the criminal matters, we, uh, the tribe contracts with the local county for incarceration. Uh, when this started getting, the outbreak started appearing real, the county wanted to get as many people out of the jail as they could so they wouldn't have liability or issues their responsibility. So they had uh, asked, who can we get rid of? We had several people, um, I don't know, half a dozen or so or more in the tribal jail that time. Uh, some of which were not violent offenders particularly, were maybe recidivists or whatever. And so we uh, consulted with the uh, prosecution and the defense attorneys and simply got them out on ORs. Uh, and what we had to do, we'd been talking about for some point, but this really accelerated and got us to finalize it, is to arrange for uh, using um, go to meeting for having the initial appearance from a tribal jail with the jailers uh, there at the and the attorney or the uh, the court staff or clerks being wherever they might happen to be hope with the court and then the judges so that we could have wouldn't have to transport pull them in and then bring them back the uh, one of the concerns that was similar between that tribal courts are the tribal jail and also some things that have come up in our juvenile matters is that if the uh, defendants are pulled out of the tribal jail, or if uh, but also similarly, if we had a child who was at a group home and went to a visit, upon their return, if they have a fever, they will not be readmitted. So then if we have a defendant pulled out of the tribal jail, has a defendant uh, a fever upon returning, they won't be admitted and we have to deal with that. If we have a child who is in a foster uh, group home and uh, goes to a visit pursuant to the juvenile orders and they are returned to the foster group home and they have a fever of whatever else, or in some instances the campus is closed so they cannot return onto campus, then we have to find an alternative placement. And in some instances we do not have alternative placements. So those are all things that we did not think about as we initially started moving forward, but now we are working our way through it. So uh, we're using more and more digital means to accommodate uh, required uh, reviews. Uh, and also we are taking to heart the uh, suggestions on how we have uh, cyber visitations or uh, we have not yet 
seen where we go for the garden egg items review or meetings and so forth. So those are all things that we are discovering as we move forward. I think that uh, in one of the meetings we've had, uh, I sat in on uh, with at the tribal level. Uh, usually I don't sit on those, but was there. And uh, managers were asking the uh, chief or second chief, <coughs> What, what do we do? How do we handle this? Because I'm not sure it's the right decision. And the, uh, they told the manager, that's what we hired you for. Your job is to make decisions. Make a decision at eight o'clock that is based upon the best information you have. If that information changes at two o'clock, you change your decision. But we have to try and make some mm -hmm. form of decision so we can move forward. So I think that's what we're doing as best we can. Uh, the, uh, we're cooperating and interacting more and more with the other departments uh, and using technology. I think that those uh, things are there. Uh, sometimes it simply isn't a good answer for these things. And I, the one thing I'm wondering about is when we do get out of this is what, what uh, ramifications we'll have as we'll see if everybody's trying to appeal our decisions as we issue these orders saying, what authority did you have to do that? I don't know, we'll find out. <laughs> Excuse me, but I think something else that we haven't talked about is that we are concerned about the safety of our clerks and judges and the public. But I think we also have to be, and I have no idea what to tell you as to continuity of a service. What happens if your clerks do get sick? What happens if you have one judge and they get sick? Uh, how do you avoid that? What do you do with that? And I don't know what your answers will happen to be. There at the Creek Nation, we have two tribal judges, myself and Judge Prescott, and we are trying to avoid being at the court at the same time, just so that if something does happen, we don't get each other infected, because getting another judge on to hear matters is a legislative and executive function, which would take 30 days, six days, and even with continuing matters that could be a problem so uh, those are also thoughts that we need to uh, yeah. worry about absolutely thank you judge and then we've had um, some comments come in regarding the the technology and being being able to record hearings um, we use zoom and we know that zoom not only records but it encrypts um, there was a concern about you know sealed requirements since a lot of, you know, once things are recorded um, through a lot of software that it might be, you know, on a server or cloud based. Um, for Zoom, you can um, download directly into your own server or to your computer. Um, Judge Hager says Blue Jeans also um, would allow you record the hearing and have a list of third parties present. Um, we use, we've used GoToMeeting and GoToMeeting does have a record function. It doesn't have um, we haven't been on it in a minute, but um, the video function wasn't as easy to navigate, but we do know that that is possible. And um, Judge Lindsay says that WebEx also has a record feature, but that you do need to download the recording and transfer it to your server. So um, that being said, there are some options if your tribe does have excellent broadband and other types of technology. Um, Danielle, um, Judge Garrett, do you want to add anything else to that? The re recording, um, so, so we've already done teleconferences and, and we have a, a smart board, it's called the MondoPad, and so part of the function of having the court clerk in the courtroom is just to, there'll be a participant in the hearing and then our recording equipment can, picks up the, either the audio on the phone or from the, our uh, smart board. So, um, so that's how we record it. All right, we have a, a couple more questions. So, so another thing about just technology in general. So something just to keep in mind um, as we use technology and things like Zoom is um, I recently sat in in a webinar offered by the AFCC and there was family court judges on there talking about how they're continuing their cases and because they have to, they're on um, so they remind people that are involved in family cases to put when they're 
when the case is going on to go to a different part of the house so they're away from the children because there's some things they want to protect the children because just like your courtroom some some hearings you don't have the kids come so that's just one thing to keep in mind if you hear family court cases is stress the people if they're able to you know that's not always the case some um, in our communities some people don't have bigger you know big homes so they can't but do everything um that you can to protect the kids still and also just a word of caution with with zoom i've been you know reading in the media that uh, people are hacking into Zoom and, and bombing your, your conferences. So uh, I haven't had it happen to me, but um, I've heard schools cautioning because a lot of the schools are using Zoom um, and, you know, random strangers are showing up on the kids' uh, Zoom feed. So just a note of caution. I, I think Zoom's working on it, but, you know, hackers are faster at technology than everybody else. Mm, absolutely. Um, we are... Um, at time, but um, Dennis Berdotwalk had asked um, whether or not anyone knew if the feds had released any guidance on whether we can pay staff who cannot come to work due to social distancing or court closures, but who also lack the technology required to work remotely. For example, do federally funded tribal court staff who can't come to work and can't work from home have to be laid off or have their pay cut? or can they be paid under some sort of emergency admin leave or something of that nature? Um, so on our website, if you go under, um, I believe it's under our work um, training and technical assistance tab, we do have a, a drop down menu and if you click on BJA, since we are one of the TA providers, um, I won't paraphrase the, the BJA guidance but if you are a grantee, a CTAS grantee, for example, there is some guidance on um, how you can move forward um, based on COVID-19. And we have copied and pasted that letter there and we've also included the link. Um, additionally, um, you know, make sure that you're looking at the, the different um, resources available under the CARES Act. I know most of uh, you all are governmental entities, but I do know that some of you participants who are on the line are part of nonprofits. Um, you're with legal services, um, or you might be a small business or business practitioner. There is um, help there available under the CARES Act. There's the PPP, which is available to nonprofits, tribal concerns, um, other small businesses, which would allow you to um, request a loan under the SBA, under the CARES Act, um, to assist with things like payroll, benefits, rent and utilities, and it is forgivable. So please take a look at that. Um, take a look at those requirements a little bit closer and see if you qualify for those. Um, also under CARES and SBA, there are emergency loans available. Um, and so I don't, if you do qualify for the PPP, I don't know if you qualify for the other emergency um, loans, but again, please take a closer look at um, the help that's available under the CARES Act. Um, take a look at the guidance under BJA, and then I haven't looked at it too closely, but we just received something about um, additional, um, a solicitation for additional supplemental funding for um, current grantees organizations from the BJA. We will make sure that that is posted as well. And I believe that they are trying to expedite the award of any supplemental funding under that particular solicitation so that you can be able to draw that money down um, in light of COVID. And it's very COVID specific. Um, I won't paraphrase exactly what that is since I haven't read it closely, but we will post that. Um, that being said, we do have a question, um, and I think it was answered about- um, Can you me? Yes. So I just wanted to mention, I did see a, a grant announcement from SAMHSA today that would apply really to healing to wellness courts about some emergency uh, funding it had a super tight turnaround. It was like due April 10th and I didn't look at the form, but so that's out there as well. Yes, and thank it's, you. It's in response to COVID-19. Thank you, Carrie. And um, again, we are keeping our eye out for any assistance for our tribal courts, especially since one of the issues that has been brought to our attention is that we do have courts that are uh, funded 
from revenue from our tribes and when the casinos uh, the casinos have been closed down that that is going to affect um, operations and the ability to to pay staff and judges and so um, a lot of tribes are looking at furloughs so um, that being said um, any information that we can pass your way we will um, I know that NCAI also has a COVID um, web page and I think that they were providing briefings on CARES Act and um, funding available to tribes under that. Um, please check National Institute's um, the Health Board, NIHB. I probably said that wrong, but um, check NIHB. They've been a really great resource as well. And then of course um, our partners, um, our state counterparts, um, we have um, our tribal counterparts as well who have information up. We really try not to invent the will and we're um, making sure that we post all the information that they have as well. So please check out NCJFCJ's site um, and check out TLPI's site for their different COVID-19 resources as well. Um, that being said, this uh, webinar has been recorded and you will have access to it and to be able to look at the, um, the questions and the chat box and um, hopefully um, throughout this process, um, you continue to reach out to us and not only for um, assistance or to connect you with other judges, but also to please keep sending us um, any of your orders, any of your change of rules. Um, we would like to upload that so that um, other tribes, either in your region or across uh, Indian country, can take a look at what you're doing and see um, whether or not that helps them move forward in their own planning. One, so, of, one, of, the thing, one of the things I want to add before we close out, Nikki, is that I know that uh, uh, Carrie and Danielle have done an unbelievable job, and there's some of the tribes that are like us that have a lot of resources. I know that some of the tribes, some of you have much fewer resources. Uh, don't feel you're overwhelmed or that you are afraid to make a decision. I know that probably each one of you is trying to do the best you can. And so just try to accommodate that. Uh, perhaps this will turn out to be we should have gone a different direction with this way or that way. But we all have to make a decision at some point. Um, and I think that uh, with these inputs, uh, it's a good thing. Um, you know, we don't all have the resources of a staff attorney or three or four clerks and so forth. So do the best you can. Uh, think of the people that we're serving. Uh, keep everybody safe. I would rather that each of our people are safe than worry about the fact that maybe we have to uh, ultimately uh, let somebody out of jail a little bit early or that uh, whatever else it happens to be. So I know that these are unusual uh, uh, times and uh, none of us really have a right answer at this point. We're just each trying to do what we can and sharing that information with you. Uh, you probably some of you thought about things we have not yet done that. So we, are, we will be interested to hear that. Uh, so with that, all I had. Thank you. And thank you again to everybody who's joined us. Um, thank you to our Niger Board of Directors and our steering committee. Um, I neglected to mention that both Carrie and Greg are board members. And um, thank you, Judge Blake. Um, thank you to our partners and our friends who will be assisting us in um, executing these um, the additional webinars that we will have weekly from here on out. So um, we hope to see a lot of you return um, next week, we, we currently have it scheduled for wellness. Uh, we will let you know tomorrow whether or not we're going to move up the child welfare related um, topics or not. And um, that being said, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. If you're sheltering in place, um, you know, reach out to us if you're feeling isolated or lonely. Um, we do Zoom daily. And um, if you, you need a friend or you want to talk something out, uh, we are here for you. Um, thank you again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Right, bye, everyone.